All right. Well, here we are at uh, the be still in the, talking about chapter 12, which is uh, talking about absorption on electrodes. And as we talked yesterday, uh, the previous time I should say, we talked about uh, molecules and ions being absorbed into the electrodes and what the effect that has on the specific double layer capacities and charges on the surfaces and importantly what the effect is on the potential distribution at the electrode interface and immediately close to the electrode. The absorption of materials on the electrodes has that effect of changing the potential as we saw previously this phi 2 effect and also it has uh, some other effects that we'll talk about now in this particular part of the, of the lecture. Um, Let's talk about the effect of adsorption. What were these couple of things that could happen? Well, we can absorb all kinds of molecules to the surface. One type of molecule we might absorb would be what we call electroactive molecules, where the molecule itself is um, an oxidizable or reducible molecule. R and O in our scheme of things. And those t molecules may be absorbed on the electrode itself. And so the electrochemistry of those molecules would be significantly different than the electrochemistry of molecules that exist in the solution. Because rather than having materials diffused to the electrode and then undergo an electron transfer, these molecules would be absorbed directly to the electrode surface and then undergo an electrode reaction. So they'll see some differences in the electrochemistry because of that. The second thing we can have is electroinactive adsorption. And uh, there's two real things we can think about. When these things are not active electrochemistry, in other words, they do not themselves participate in electron transfer. They don't accept an electron or give up an electron, but they can have an effect because they can be blocking. In other words, the presence of these adsorbates on the electrode surface can cause a reduction in the activity of the electrode because it's not, is no longer completely active. There's blocking by some adsorbed material on the surface. Or B, it can be, they can be catalytic. The presence of these adsorbates may themselves not undergo electrochemistry but may cause electrocatalysis or catalysis of an electrode reaction. So that, in this case, rather than causing a decrease in the activity, they may actually increase the activity of the electrode surface. Uh, if we have electroactive species, the methods of uh, studying those electroactive species that are absorbed on the surface are similar to what we've already discussed. Uh, for example, electroactive species can be studied by CV techniques cyclic voltammetry techniques. And in this case, again, the, the response will be different than the CV for diffusional-based systems, but we can still use the same linear sweep out and back to get some information. Also, potential step methods can be used, just like they can be, and they can, again, they would not give the Cottrell-type response, but would give a, a, a characteristic response for adsorbed molecules. And once we have a potential step, we can measure the current or we can convert that current to a charge and do chronolamperometry or chronocoulometry and analyze the data that way. Now for electroinactive species, we have less obvious methods to uh, examine their effect. But for example, we've already talked about at mercury electrodes, the, the capacity and the surface tension effects can be easily ascertained with those measurements and that can tell you whether we've got inactively absorbed molecules on the surface. Now solid electrodes, that surface tension measurements are much more difficult and so they're not very easily used. Um, it's hard to really pin down one specific technique that people would use. There's lots of different methods at that point. One way would be looking at uh, perturbations in uh, normal electrochemistry. If we look at 
a normal electrochemical response and then we have a, an adsorbed molecule on that electrode, uh, we'll see a change and that will clue us in at least that something is adsorbed on the surface and so we'll talk about that. For example, um, uh, I show in the notes a very characteristic test that people often use for determining whether or not something may be adsorbed on the surface. Remember the reduction of protons in, on a platinum electrode, for example, is undergoes this proton absorbs, undergoes electron transfer and then that radical absorbs on the electrode. There's a metal hydride bond on the metal itself. And if we look at the um, surface waves for that process, remember they look something like this where you've got oxygen and the hydrogen, adsorbed hydrogen waves on the platinum surface. But if we have something adsorbed on the electrode surface, what happens to those waves? Well, those waves may become smeared out or less distinct. And just by looking at that electrode, you probably have a pretty good idea that there's some problem with that material and because the adsorbed material is adsorbing at spots where the hydrogen radical would adsorb, it's no longer able to give these nice distinct wave shapes and so that's a test that people would often do to test their electrode to see if it's very clean or not and that's a very sensitive test. Let's now talk about these uh, non-mercury surfaces uh, some more. Um, as we said, there's, it's tricky to measure some of these things with non-mercury surfaces because the surface itself is not something that's unique on a non-liquid surface. Uh, mercury has, or non-mercury surfaces like gold or platinum or carbon has different crystal crystallites that are present in the surface. You can, you could buy a single crystal electrode to do your electrochemistry on, but they're very expensive and very difficult to keep pristine. Uh, you don't want to spend several thousand dollars on a single crystal of something and then um, have you ruin it in one day by polishing it incorrectly. So that's, that's not something people would normally do. So we have, uh, but certain people do when they are really, really interested in these sorts of effects. But under normal situations, you don't have that, you don't have that uh, freedom. You have um, crystal edges, you have these microcrystalline regions with different crystalline faces, the 110 face or the 001 face or the 111 face. All those crystalline uh, structures have different electron transfer rates typically and um, because they have different electronic properties. More complicated than we'll really get into this class. Um, and they also, because they are a liquid, they're sort of frozen in s space, they can't heal themselves. So they have defect sites. They have sites where there may be an atom is missing on the surface crystalline lattice. Or you might have a, a non-metallic impurity in that material or a, a different sort of metal impurity on the surface of those metals. So it's impossible to really get a very unique um, crystalline metal surface on the, uh, on the mercury electrode. Also, mer these metal electrodes tend to be more polarizable or less polarizable because you know you saw in mercury with the in the KCL solution you can polarize it out to very negative potentials uh, to avoid the proton reduction while platinum and gold and say carbon or other electrodes don't have that luxury you, you start reducing uh, protons very easily so it's much more difficult to look at surface um, processes and absorbate processes when you have a very limited range of potentials in which you can look at where there is no Faradaic response. Uh, and so under, especially for aqueous solutions, it's a difficult process. Uh, Non-aqueous solutions a little bit easier sometimes. But there are some things you can do. One thing to do with non-mercury surfaces is to measure what they call the differential capacitance directly. And the idea with this is that you can take a, uh, a ramp of potential 
just like normal, but I superimpose upon that ramp a very small amplitude <coughs> sinusoidal wave. And as you sweep the potential, there is a small high frequency sinusoidal wave on top of that. And that may be 5 to 25 millivolts AC. <coughs> and the idea there was that if you look and you filter out the low frequency response and just look at the frequency response of the voltage that you've applied, you will get a current that's at the same frequency as your applied voltage, but it'll have a uh, different phase and a different amplitude depending on how much capacity you have in the electrode surface. And if you go back to your physics textbooks, you can actually derive the, the uh, response. And for a pure capacitor, you'd have a, a 90 degree phase shift uh, in that thing. And what you can do then is use that information and plot out the capacitance as a function of potential. And you can actually do it, and you can see in certain circumstances, you can see a little capacity dip. And remember, that's going to be close to the PZC where that little dip is. And so on metal electrodes, if you're very careful at preparing the metal electrodes, you can get very clean solutions and so on. You can actually make those measurements. What else can you do? Well, you can resort to uh, uh, hybrid methods where you use electrochemistry and some other uh, process. And um, one way to do that would be to uh, do something where you actually measure directly the surface tension. And this is kind of an interesting method. You use a piezoelectric material usually a piezo-ceramic. And remember, piezoelectrics have a property of ch causing a change in their dimensions with, a, with a, um, a voltage. Or if they are apply a voltage to these piezoelectric materials, they cause a change in their dimensions as well. So if you put your metal electrode as a very thin foil on top of that piezo-ceramic, and you apply various potentials, when the surface tension changes, you will see a change in the metal foil as it may expand or contract as the surface tension of the metal itself changes. And what will happen then is that piezoelectric material will develop a voltage because it's bonded to that metal itself. So as the metal expands, the piezoelectric will expand and then it will cause a voltage to be emitted by the piezoelectric. And this is a, what they call a surface stress method. So the idea would be you'd uh, change the metal voltage very slowly, and then you would mo monitor the voltage out of the piezoceramic. And by looking at that, you can correlate the voltage out with the surface tension of the metal and uh, get surface tension curves versus voltage just like you did with the mercury electrode. <laughs> Um, usually you would use then a, um, a, not a DC change, but you'd actually use a, a, a lock-in or a, uh, an AC method, which will help make the stability of the measurement a little better. There's a uh, reference. I think it's in the Journal of the Electrochemical Society. Nineteen eighty-seven, uh, page one thirty-four, volume uh, one one three eight. What's that? Volume one thirty-four. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, what volume one thirty-four? Page uh, one one three eight. Sorry. I haven't seen too much more of that, but that's, a, that's an interesting method. The other method that's uh, useful, especially if you're very interested, is you could use radioisotopes. And this is used actually quite a bit. Um, the idea would be you would put a, uh, a th your thin foil next to a uh, Geiger counter or some other radiation detector scintillation device. As your uh, radioactive material becomes absorbed onto the metal electrode, 
you will see a change in the radioactivity at the Geiger counter and you can correlate that radioactive change with the amount of adsorbed ions. So you could use a radioactive isotope of chloride and that would uh, tell you how much the chloride ions are adsorbed at the metal surface. And that wouldn't give you the uh, capacity directly, but it would give you the surface excess of chloride, which is what you're really interested in, or whatever other thing you have. And so this is a very, uh, it's a fairly simple idea, but it actually works pretty well. The only problem is you have to use radioactive materials to do the experiment. Um, the other thing is the ultra-high vacuum methods are also useful for determining adsorbed species on the surface. Uh, I'll just give you a, um, a reference that you can read Cotts and his colleagues. Journal of Electroanalytical Chemistry, uh, volume 2 and 5, page 3. 31, and um, the idea here is that you would take your electrode and what, do what they call an immersion test. And I think it's just one M. And immersion is opposed to immersion where you add stuff to the solution, you're taking it out. The idea here is the, if you take a uh, electrode out of the solution carefully, um, you can actually maintain the double layer structure at the particular potential that you've applied. And once you've done that, then you can sort of freeze that in place by removing the solvent, and then you can use ultra-high vacuum te te techniques to understand the surface properties. Low energy electron diffraction or XPS or Auger techniques. And you can try to determine what concentration and what species are present up absorbed on the electrode surface. It seems a little bit like it'd be unlikely that you could do this, but in fact people have claimed good results uh, in this particular method. Another guy that's, uh, so if you're really interested in this, Art Hubbard and his group um, did a lot of work in this particular area and uh, really perfected the method as far as that goes. You can also do methods of spectroscopy. that are in situ rather than ex situ, which would, this would be out of solution. And this in situ method suggests that we can do it directly in there. And so the idea would be you would have to use some spectroscopy that would not be affected significantly by the presence of uh, the supporting electrolyte or the a solution that's present in the system. And um, FTIR, is okay. The problem with that was that we'd have to worry about water adsorption, so you have to take some pains to do the technique to remove the effect of water adsorption by the infrared. Uh, Raman spectroscopy um, is, uh, is a little bit better because the water uh, scattering is not a, a problem, but uh, it's got poor sensitivity typically. You can do surface enhanced Raman, which is, which is useful. Uh, again, the problem is poor sensitivity and high adsorption of the uh, supporting electrolyte. Um, one uh, method that we, you can think about is to use uh, total reflectance, attenuated total reflectance spectroscopy where you bring the, the light in at a certain angle and it will be totally reflected inside the surface except for uh, the surface of a some wave guide of some sort, a crystal of material, except above the solution there is, a, as they call it, an evanescent wave above the uh, wave guide and so a very small fraction of the light escapes into the interface between the solution and the wave guide and that amount is dependent on the impinging angle of the light beam and the frequency of the light and that amount of evanescent wave is a nanometers type thing and so that's pretty useful actually for studying that solution right at the uh, electrode solution interface. Now you might think well you got to worry a little bit of there has to be an electrode there and so you'd have to put in a thin enough metal electrode there so that you don't get uh, attenuation of the light by the metal itself. So what you do is you put a very thin, say, gold coating on that 
if you put a, a thin enough gold coating, a few tens of nanometers, in fact, the light still gets through and you can do the experiment. That evanescent wave is still capable of getting through that uh, electrode. And so that's, that's a, a pretty useful technique and uh, it requires some experience with spectroscopy, but uh, a guy named Stan Pons did a lot of work on this. Um, I'll let you read up this rather old paper on it. Pons is not no longer in the in situ spectroscopy business because he's the guy that did the cold fusion experiments or claimed to, so he's got other things to worry about. But in fact, uh, the stuff he did with the spectroscopy was quite good and uh, is a, shouldn't be held against him that he later went kind of crazy with the cold fusion. Um, and other people have done that as well, so. <clears throat> Where are we at here? Okay. So let's change the change. So now we've, we've got these methods. I'm not going to go into all the methods, how you actually do the experiments so you can read up on them. They're not that important. The point is that there's a number of different ways that you can look at, at the amount of adsorbed material on the surface. So inactive materials can be studied. Uh, mercury electrodes with surface tension methods with uh, metal electrodes, solid metal electrodes with all these methods we've talked about here. They're not all, none of them are really easy to do, but they're all available. And so if somebody really wants to do those experiments, they're available for you to, to know how to do. Okay. They're all basically physical chemistry type experiments, so you may not be interested in those in particular.